So I'm Thomas Wilson, and I'm the VP of Product Management at Graphcore, and going to be talking to you to a certain extent about new approaches in NLP, but actually, to an even larger extent, basically talking about new approaches in general. We'll talk about it within an NLP context here, but really asking folks to sort of sit back and sort of take a second look at how we approach these kinds of machine learning models and new ways that might be possible. Because to some extent, the industry has kind of got into a certain thought process around how DNN models, how AI models are implemented. And not to put too fine a point on it, to a certain extent, it's a little bit of GPU thing, because for good reason, it's been an important architecture to help us get to where we are now. But what we would like to begin to in introduce is a different kind of thought process. New approaches to existing AI model architectures that you have now that might allow you to come at those AI models from a different angle and achieve different goals. So for want of a better term, I'm going to invite you to maybe try a little IPU think and, and look at different ways that we can approach these kinds of AI model challenges. So for the last few years, of course, we made a lot of progress uh, in machine intelligence with more advanced deep learning techniques to be able to detect objects with increasing accuracy within images, not just cats, but lots of other things too. We have new models that can understand the basic structure of language. But I think you'll all agree that we're really just at the very start that there are new kinds of approaches, new model architectures that would yield even greater accuracy. Models that could encompass a greater context of the world around us for more advanced kinds of perception. But all of these things come at a cost. And you've already seen something like this in the last talk, and it's, it's on everybody's mind, right? You're gonna see a, a, a lot of this, this exponential growth in compute requirements. Again, this is derived from that OpenAI article where they were talking on the range of 300,000 times growth in compute requirements uh, from the times of AlexNet to where we are you know, with AlphaGo Zero. And of course, that really comes about because of the increasing model size. We've talked about that too. But it's not just model size for model size sake. This is all about accuracy. It's all about a relentless pursuit of increasing accuracy because the customers, the end customers, the search engines, the financial companies, and so on, Every percent of accuracy buys revenue. It has a direct impact to the top line. It's all about accuracy. So more data to train models to better accuracy, more parameters to encompass the increased learning that's required for that increased accuracy. But you can certainly imagine that with these kinds of exponential growth trends, there's a lot of interest in model efficiency and sparsification, getting more bang for your buck per weight. So sparsification, sparsifying these models, getting sparser weights to get more efficiency, the challenge there is it doesn't necessarily map well to legacy SIMD, SIMT architectures. Now GraphCore over the last few years um, has spoken to a number of researchers, to different machine learning experts in the marketplace, and the message has come through loud and clear that the legacy processors and the architectures that we're used to are, to a large extent, actually hindering where we can go next. And it's not uncommon for me to talk to researchers who work in private companies uh, or in, um, in more of an academic setting, saying that there are sparse models that they would like to go and explore, but they can't efficiently do that. So they sort of focus on what they know, on what they can actually run, because they have to get papers out. They have to make progress with what they've got. So for us to make progress then, a new approach is required to enable people to start to explore areas, research directions that they haven't really been able to explore before. Yes, they still have sound model architectures that they want to continue to explore. So you certainly need to support that. But at the same time, you want to open opportunities. So we're used to CPUs, of course. Uh, they were developed for scalar processing and running applications, a GPU for 
graphics processing and to a certain extent some um, additional cores kind of retrofitted um, to, help with map, to help with dense matte mold and things like that. But the intelligence processing unit, the IPU, has been developed from the ground up for these kinds of machine intelligence workloads to enable more flexible approach to these kinds of models. So let's look at that in more detail. A good way to describe the IPU is basically as a massively parallel MIMD processor, which is quite in contrast to the SIMD, SIMT kind of architectures that we're used to. So it's a massively parallel MIMD architecture with over 1,200 independent processor cores that we call IPU tiles. Now, each of these IPU tiles um, has got uh, its own dedicated non-shared uh, in-processor memory. So it's 256 k byte of in-processor memory for processor tile, for IPU tile, for a total of 300 megabyte of in-processor memory across this processor. It's a huge amount of SRAM. And what that's about is 45 terabytes per second, high bandwidth, low latency, energy efficient memory available on the processor itself. And what this allows you to do is fit entire models onto the processor. So there's no going back and forth to off-chip memory to HBM and things like that. Everything's held right on chip. There's lots of SRAM to hold models to allow for more sparse implementations. So a, a more flexible memory access model getting at s sparse data, perhaps smaller kernels, maybe kernels that have gone through some sort of depth-wise kind of separable convolution or group-wise to allow you to go after smaller kernels, more sparsely populated data. So a very different kind of processing approach and a very different kind of memory architecture. Now, the other thing is these massively parallel independent MIMD uh, processors are also multi-threaded. So there are six threads for processor tile, um, which allows for something over 7,000 independent processor threads, each working on what's available as smaller blocks of data. So for example, when you mention threads in GPU think, it's easy to start thinking about threads in a warp. So you think if you've worked with GPUs, you know that you have maybe 32 wet, uh, threads that are combined in a warp, and you basically have to put as much data, load the great big vectors across the warp to make the most efficient use of those threads. So it's large blocks of data, deep kernels, dense map mall, that's what it's about. Very different with this, these kinds of threads where you have in massively parallel independent processor threads. So another way of describing the IPU is as a fine-grained, massively parallel MIMD processor with large amounts of in-processor memory to enable flexible data and kernel accessing approaches for new, for new requirements for sparsity and sparsification. Now, another key architectural feature is down on the lower right of, of the picture, the IPU links. Again, sort of you're used to thinking about links, you might think of another kind of link on another kind of processor, but IPU links are very different than what you might be used to. So they're high bandwidth, 320 gigabyte per second, but it's more than just the bandwidth, it's about how the IPU links connect multiple IPUs into essentially a contiguous IPU compute resource. Our tools, the popular SDK tool chain, compiles very large graphs against multiple IPUs connected through IPU link as basically just a large contiguous IPU compute resource. This is all seamless from the user's perspective. It's all managed by the tools. But what this creates is a lot of flexibility and new opportunities for implementing large models across multiple processors. Now, just a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, at SC19, we announced uh, with Dell uh, the availability of the DSS8440 IPU server. Um, this is the server platform uh, that our customers have been using to evaluate um, our tools and the IPU. This is the server platform that we use to generate um, new um, benchmarks and code examples and model examples and micro benchmarks that are available on public GitHub for you to go and begin to play with. So it's worthwhile then to look at this architecture in just a bit more detail. So this is sort of a topological view of the DSS 8440. You can see there are eight 
of the GraphCore C2 cards. There are two IPUs per C2 card. And what's key about this topology is how all of those, all 16 of the IPUs are connected through IPU link. So this is basically a 2D mesh. And all of those 16 IPUs connected through IPU link means that the popular SDK, our tool chain, is able to basically consider those 16 IPUs as a contiguous IPU compute resource when it comes to implementing and compiling large graphs uh, onto multiple processors. And it does this in a really flexible way. So a, a key tool within the popular SDK is the graph compile domain. So GCD um, enables scalable model parallelism. You know, we're all used to very, very wide use of data parallelism in terms of, of how we implement these AI models. But model parallelism has a lot of power, a lot of flexibility that, that you can take advantage of. So the graph compile domain allows you to target with your model 1 to 16 IPUs, so basically leverage all of the IPUs in the IPU server. It uh, will flexibly map the models across the IPUs. It's integrated with TensorFlow uh, and other frameworks that we support via Popart. That's our popular advanced runtime and our popular SDK. And it provides you with really high performance model parallelism right out of the box. And by that, I mean it compiles, you instantiate it in your 8440 server, and you get performance right out of the box. There's no follow-on tweaking and having to play around with some sort of API to, to, to get it all work. You don't need to worry about the communication between the processors or how it's synchronized and how the whole thing's managed. It just works in its high performance. And there certainly are a number of code examples and model examples that we provided for people to go and play and actually try this. So let's look at some examples. So the first example is more data parallel. So we're used to data parallelism. I don't have to spend a lot of time on that. In this case, we're looking at a BERT-based inference example. This is one approach you could use, where the GCD, the graph compiled domain, is set at 2. So basically, the BERT-based inference model is divided across two IPUs. So you can see that for each of the C2 cards, each C2 card has a replica of the BERT-based inference model. And there are eight of those uh, um, across the server. Now, since the model is sharded, is divided across two IPUs, pipelining is really important to ensure that you get maximum efficiency, that those IPUs are being utilized as optimally as possible. This becomes even more important when you start looking at um, more extensive model parallelism implementation possibilities. So for example, this is one approach that you might take for a BERT large training, where you take the BERT large training model, um, assign a graph compile domain of 14 IPUs, and then the popular SDK through GCD will map BERT large model across 14 of the IPUs in your Dell server, and it just works. So you can see that the forward pass going from the embedding layer down in the model on, on, on the left goes through each of the layers, and there are activations that are passed from layer to layer as it goes along. Well, those layers you see, I've, if you follow the kind of color coding that we've used, have been mapped onto the C2 cards, and the arrow, the blue arrows that are going around from IPU to IPU shows how the forward pass is moving through the IPUs through the various layers back out again. Now, this is a training example, so the backward pass would move back the opposite way. Now, pipelining plays a really important role here to keep it performance. And pipe, pipelining is one of those features that's just built in to the popular SDK. It's not something you necessarily need to worry about, but it's built in as a feature. Now, we all have an intuitive sense of what pipelining means, but just to make it more clear, it's good to have some pictures just to walk through it. So from an inference perspective, pipelining is rather more straightforward. Um, you see that on the left, there are four IPUs. So imagine that we're pipelining. We have divided or sharded a model across four IPUs in that server. So we've occupied two of those C2 cards. The model has been divided in four pieces across four IPUs, going from IPU 1 at the top down to IPU 4 at the bottom, with time going along the x-axis. You feed a batch of data into the first IPU. It does some processing for the forward activation, say, passes the activations on to the next IPU. Uh, for the next layer or the next shard of the, of the model, and then through IPU link, and then passes the activations on over IPU link from IPU to IPU over time. So 
here to ensure that that first IPU is kept busy, well, you can send another batch of data right after it passes its activations off. It can jump on to the next batch of data, and you can basically pipeline it over time so that when you're right into the, the heart of the pipeline, all four IPUs are kept busy processing a different batch of data over time. So this is fairly easy to follow from an inference perspective. But this becomes a little bit more complicated when you look at model parallel pipelining for training. And this is another thing that's just handled by the popular SDK. We make it very easy and efficient. So you don't just need to worry about the forward pass now. Say now we have three IPUs, IPU1 to IPU3. The forward pass is basically an inference run going from the first IPU over time to the third IPU. But now you have a backward pass going back through the same IPUs, taking the gradient updates, doing the weight updates in the, in the backward pass. The first IPU would be idle unless you could pipeline, which you can. So in a similar way that we did the pipelining for inference, you can do that for training. So you overlay the next forward back, backward pass in parallel with the other forward and backward pass. And you keep doing that, and you can develop a very complete full pipeline for training as well, where you have forward and backward pass overlaid on top of each other. So that when you get into, again, the heart of the model, the heart of the pipeline, rather, um, all of those IPUs are busy. In fact, um, IPU2 in that dashed box is doing a few things at the, at the same time. It's computing the forward pass activations as well as computing the backward pass gradient updates and weight updates and recomputing the activations from a previous forward pass. So recomputing is another tool in the toolbox that allows for efficient and flexible mapping of large models onto multiple IPUs. So we talk about the IPU as an addition to the toolbox in terms of machine intelligence, but actually it's like a whole new toolbox with a bunch of new tools that you can play with in terms of model parallelism, pipelining, recomputation, all sorts of new tools, a different kind of thought process, an IPU think, when it comes to developing implementations for models in different ways. So does, is, is, is it worth it? Well, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago at SC19, we released a whole raft of new benchmarks. Benchmarks that we had developed in concert with lead customers who were exploring problems that were really important to them, problems that they were stuck with legacy architectures. They needed a new approach. So a number of the benchmarks that you'll see uh, will show multiple times advantage versus legacy GPUs and different kinds of uh, processor architectures. So uh, we certainly invite you to go and have a look at the, the, the set of benchmarks and coding examples and micro benchmarks that we've released. And it's not just about CNN. It's, uh, it's LSTM, it's GRU, it's RNN, it's non-DNN things like Markov Chain and Monte Carlo, um, which is used a lot in finance. There's a lot, of, there's a lot of life in machine learning and machine intelligence outside of ResNet and CNN. But we have ResNet too, so go have a look at that. We have big advantages in terms of throughput at low latency because our finely grained, massively parallel MIMD processor is really efficient at low batch size. But a couple benchmarks that I want to highlight here because this talk is mostly about NLP. Is, uh, is BERT. So we have a BERT-based inference, uh, which shows three times higher throughput at lower latency. And this is something, a theme that you'll see in all of our inference benchmarks. The high efficiency that we have at low batch size means that we can really provide much higher throughput at low latency. And this is so important so for so many inference use cases. You'll see that with our ResNext, with our ResNet, with our BERT, across a number of different model examples that we provide. For BERT training, uh, we show basically state-of-the-art training uh, with BERT base, um, which is pretty awesome, actually, when you, when you think that we're just right out of the gate. We're, we have a whole road of optimization ahead of us to begin to, to move ahead and drive performance onwards. But what's really exciting is the 
work going towards sparsification of NLP is really key. NLP models are amongst the biggest and growing fast. So the pressure on sparsification, sparse transformers, new sparse approaches is really key. And uh, we expect the IPU and the architectural approach that we have to begin to entice people into IPU think, to begin to start thinking about models with the IPU in mind. To a large, large extent, I mean, Bert was sort of developed with TPUs in mind and GPUs in mind, that sort of dense map ball kind of um, architecture, kind of SIMT, SIMD approach. New transformers, new NLPs, people will begin to maybe think differently, develop an IPU think, and come at those models from the ground up in a very different way. And we look forward to working with the research community in beginning to explore new approaches. Now, one of the ways that you can begin to explore these new approaches and begin your road to hype, you think, uh, is uh, on Microsoft Azure. So a few weeks ago at SC19, we also announced, it was a very exciting week, a lot going on. We also announced uh, the availability of the IPU as a new processing architecture for preview on Microsoft Azure. So you can certainly go and contact Microsoft about how to access the IPUs. We also have a partner, Cirrus Scale, uh, who provides access to the Cirrus Scale cloud uh, to make use of those DSS 8440 servers on the Cirrus Scale cloud, or you can go to Cirrus Scale and buy servers. So we have a number of different ways for you to begin to play with the tools. Poplar SDK, easy, flexible, code examples, uh, and um, it, it's all set up for you to begin to explore. So our goal here is literally what we write in our, in our mission statement, we, to let innovators create the next breakthroughs in machine intelligence. That's what it's about. It's giving you new approaches for existing models to do different things, achieve different goals, but also explore directions that you haven't been able to explore before because of the thought process that we have necessarily been sort of locked into. So we look forward to working with all your researchers, and um, to begin to in introduce you to what you can do with the IPU. Thank you.